Hi, it's me, Franklin, and here I am on a hill. This week we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about processes. In chapters 4 and 5 you're going to learn about what a process is in, in detail. So what kind of data structures, what makes a process a process, and what makes it different from a program. In chapter 5 you're going to be looking at the API for creating new processes. So on Unix systems, you're going to be using this fork and exec model. In chapter six, we're going to be taking a look at how an operating system and how hardware need to work together to get a process actually working on a processor. We're eventually going to talk about scheduling. So how the operating system makes decisions about who gets to go next. So which process actually gets to run next on the processor. But in this chapter we're going to be really just looking at the basic idea. Once we've decided, let's assume that we've made this decision about which process gets to go next. Once we've made that decision, how does the operating system and the hardware work together to get this process running on the CPU? And once it is running on the CPU, what do we have to do to make sure that it can work as quickly as possible and as safely as possible? The basic, the basic approach to getting a process actually running on a processor is something called direct execution. This is kind of a weird idea. This is kind of a weird idea because everything that we have been thinking about in terms of programs running on a processor up until this point in our lives, you know, where our lives are right now in operating systems, has basically been, well, of, of course, a program runs on a processor. Of course, a process runs on a processor. How else could you possibly do it? There, there are other ways to do this. So one way to do it would be emulation. You, you may have heard of this idea of an emulator before in terms of gaming. And that's a, basically a program that will read a binary file, which is a program itself. So a program that reads another program. And then as it's reading that program, will dynamically translate the instructions so that they work on the CPU that this program is actually running on. So it's emulating this other processor. That's one other way to do it. Another other way to do it, and it's actually sort of the same thing, is this idea of interpretation. Now think about what happens with a Java program. When you write a Java program, you write your code in Java, you hit that compile button and it emits bytecode. Bytecode itself is not something that runs directly on a processor. You maybe got told that in Comp 1010, you maybe got told that in Comp 1020, but you really didn't have to think very much about it. The Java virtual machine itself, so the JVM, what actually starts running when you hit the run button, that is interpreting this bytecode. It's taking that program that has been emitted by the compiler, the Java compiler, and it's doing sort of the same thing as an emulator. So it's taking that program and it's running actual CPU instructions that correspond to what the bytecode is supposed to do. Those are the two other options that you have for Let's run this program on the CPU. You may have heard this idea that C is close to hardware. And in that sense, that's true. C programs, when you compile them and when you run them, they run on the processor. And that's what this first part of the chapter is about, is taking instructions and actually executing those instructions on a CPU. The very first section here, limited direct execution It's actually more uh it's a better a better description for this is direct execution so this is section 6.1 of the textbook describes this idea let's take a program and let it run on a processor the very first thing that i want to talk about is uh figure 6.1 so this is the first figure in the chapter it says direct execution without limits so stepping through this figure the basic idea here is that the operating system has some stuff that it needs to do when a process is being launched. So one process starts this whole operation. There's one single process that the operating system will launch itself. 
And then that process has the responsibility ultimately of forking and execing many, 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 many more processes. Ultimately though, the operating system, every time there's a new process that's created, the first thing that's happening here in this figure 6.1 is create an entry in the process list for the process. This is our first data structure, well, our second data structure, I guess, after the process control block. The process list is a list of running processes that an operating system keeps track of. As processes are created, the operating system has to make a new entry for that process in the process list. Once it's done that, then the operating system has to allocate some memory. So it has responsibility of allocating memory, but this is explicitly not the same thing as malloc. This is explicitly not the same thing as dynamic memory allocation in your user program. This is the operating system creating uh, an allocation of memory for this process in the kernels in the operating system's own memory area. Load the program into memory. So this is basically taking the program off of disk and bringing it into memory. So programs can be encoded in binary formats. One of them is called ELF. And an operating system then has the responsibility of reading that program off of disk and then loading it into memory itself. That binary file has information about the program, metadata, but it also has all of the instructions for the program and all the data for the program. Next, it says set up the stack with argc and argv. So this is the entry point into the programs that we write, int main. And then we have int argc and then char double star argv. So the argument list that are being passed to the program. The operating system actually has to populate those arrays. It says clear registers. So once a process starts running on the process, processor, it has to have a, kind of a default state. So the processor has to clear all the registers. And then finally it calls main, the operating system calls main. And at that point, our program is going to take over and start execution. So run main, now we're switching over to the program side of this diagram. And then it just runs main and it runs the entire program to completion. And then we execute return from main. And then finally we switch over to the operating system side again. So we've made one transition from operating system to user program and then one transition back from user program to operating system. Then the operating system has to free up that memory that it allocated for the process and then finally remove it from the process list. This is, this is great because it kind of means that we can get a process running on our processor. But the problem with it is that the operating system can't get control back from that program as it stands right now. The operating system sets all this stuff up. It tells the, the program, okay, you can start running your main code and then just takes over, the process takes over, and the operating system is kind of sitting in the corner, I don't know, sobbing quietly to itself because it can't do anything. Only once that program has finished can the operating system take over. This is not great, and it doesn't really reflect what we want to get from an operating system. It doesn't really reflect how an operating system works in terms of it appears as though many different processes are running at the same time. This is really good because it means that the process that's running, the program that's running, gets to run as quickly as possible on hardware itself, directly on hardware. But it's not great because it doesn't let us have multiple processes running at the same time. One other problem that we have is that in this specific state, without thinking about anything else, the process needs to have complete control over the hardware. So we're kind of back into this world of the process having complete access to everything. And we don't really want that. There's other programs that are possibly running on this, this hardware, and we don't really want to have uh, random processes just reading and writing everything from, for example, a hard drive. So there's two problems here. One is that we want to have, have the ability to get control of the processor again. So we as the operating system, we want to get control of the, op, the processor back from the processes that we've started. And the other thing is that we want to be able to limit access to certain things, 
Processes that are running shouldn't be allowed to just do whatever they feel like. We want to be able to limit access to some parts of the system so that we can, for example, have permissions on files so that other processes, once a process or a user has created a file, just random processes can't just read for or write from those files that those other users and processes have created. So let's address the first problem. The first problem is restriction. We want to restrict access to certain things so that processes, once they're running, don't just have complete control of the system. Here, there's not a lot that we as an operating system can do in pure software to accomplish this. There's not a lot that we can do. The way that we are going to do this is using something that's called a system call. System calls, as we saw last class, look a lot like a function call. They look like a procedure call. We used a couple of system calls when we were looking at reading binary files, open, read, and lseq. Those really, really look like function calls, and they appear as though they are function calls in the code that we're writing, but they are not executed in the same way that function calls are normally executed. We are not pushing stuff necessarily onto the same stack that we would when we're calling a function within our own program. The thing that we need to use to do this is a little bit of extra help from our hardware in the form of modes. We're gonna have different modes in hardware. We're gonna have different modes in hardware. The different modes are basically going to turn on and off different features or different uh, actions that a process can take or different instructions that a process can execute. We're gonna have two modes for now. Real modern processors have many more modes than this, but we're just gonna think about two modes for now. The first one is user mode. In user mode, we're going to be running in restricted access. And that means that certain instructions, like instructions that would conduct IO, are not going to be permitted. The other mode of execution that we're going to have is kernel mode. And we're going to need to be able to switch between these two things. The hardware and the operating system have to work together to accomplish this. This can't be done in software alone. The processor has to provide support for an operating system to be able to set this up. And it has to be able to provide support for user programs and processes to be able to ask for a switch to happen into kernel mode so that the operating system can take over and do stuff for us. We're gonna switch now to taking a look at figure 6.2. So in figure 6.2, the very first thing that an operating system does is, on the left side of the diagram, is this thing called initializing the trap table. Initializing the trap table, this is a hardware feature where an operating system can tell some hardware when certain instructions are executed, I want you to run this code. So initialize the trap table, and then you'll see on the hardware column here, it says, remember address of syscall handler. So the operating system says, hey, when this instruction is executed, you should start running this specific code at this specific address in memory. This is when the operating system is starting up. So when the machine is turning on. Once the operating system has kind of started up to a point where processes can actually be launched, then a lot of the same stuff happens here. So in the, in the column for OS at run on the left side, we're creating an entry in the process list, we're allocating memory for that program, loading the program into memory, we're setting up the stack with argv and argc, and then we're filling kernel stack with registers and program counters, and then we're issuing this thing return from trap. What this basically means is that a process has been launched by that fork system call. The fork system call is now returning. The fork system call is a system call that's going to be serviced by this syscall handler, which was invoked by an instruction that, that, create, that, that creates the- Have you ever had a dream that, that you, um, you had, you, you, you could, you do, you, you want, you, you could do so, you, you do, you could, you, you want, you want him to do you so much you could do anything? This trap. The hardware then 
So in the middle column, restores registers from the kernel stack. It's moving to user mode, so this switch is happening. And then it's jumping to main in the, the user program. The user program then starts executing. And what happens is we make a system call. So we have to eventually make a system call to do something like IO. And at that point, we're not executing a function call, but rather we're issuing a trap instruction. The trap instruction then is going to tell hardware, I need to switch back into kernel mode so that the kernel can actually service this request. So back in the middle column now, we're saving the registers again to the kernel stack. We're moving to kernel mode and then we're jumping to the trap handler. In the operating system side now, we're trying to figure out what the system call was, who called it, and what they want us to do. We do that work and then we return from trap. Then we go back to hardware. Hardware does some, some, some magic moving these registers around and then switching back to user mode so that we can then execute, continue executing code in main, and then finally exiting. Once the program exits, exit itself is a system call. We see this often as just return from main, but uh, in the library, the user libraries that we're looking at ultimately return from main issues and exit system call. And then finally, we go straight back to the operating system side and we remove the process from the list and re we reclaim the memory that was allocated for that process. So that's great. This means that we've got a mechanism now to limit access to certain features on the processor. We have this idea of modes. We can switch between them. The operating system can work with the hardware to set up and tell the hardware what it wants to switch to. So it sets up that trap table. The trap table tells the hardware what code in the operating system should run when a system call is being made. The hardware is facilitating this whole thing, but this is kind of an operation that's happening between the operating system and the user process. We've also now got a mechanism to regain control of the processor on the operating system side. The operating system can regain control of the processor from a user process when a syscall happens. So looking at this diagram again, you can see it moving back and forth between user mode and, and kernel mode and uh, operating system mode anytime a system call happens. So we sort of solved those two problems that we have, restricted access and being able to regain control of the CPU. Except we sort of haven't. We've solved the problem of modes. We've solved the problem of control of uh, user programs not being able to do certain things. We unfortunately haven't solved the problem of user processes giving back control of the processor to the operating system. Now think about this for a second. We have to imagine that a program is eventually gonna make a system call. We have to imagine that. Eventually it's gonna say, hey, I gotta do IO, I need to do IO. But that really doesn't have to happen. It really doesn't have to happen. It doesn't have to happen like while there's a tight loop, for example. What happens if, for example, you get stuck in an infinite loop? Raise your hand right now. How many of you have written code that yields an infinite loop? Me. How many of you have written code that uh, computes, for example, something like pi? How many system calls do you think computing pi has to do? What we've got right now is cooperatively preemptive processes. Preemption here is giving up access. Cooperative processes here are only giving up access to the CPU when they issue a system call. That's not ideal because one process, a poorly programmed process could just retain control of the CPU if it's an infinite loop, or a maliciously coded program could just retain control of the CPU by never doing system calls, in theory, or, you know, arithmetic code can just retain control of the CPU forever because it's never doing system calls. That's possible. We're going to use this term yielding the processor to describe this approach only give up access to the processor when a system call is being made. But that's not great, it's not super ideal. Instead, we want to do preemptive 
uh, taking back of the processor. Cooperative preemption. Cooperative preemption, I'm gonna refer to this just generally as cooperative uh, multitasking. Cooperative multitasking is, I will let you tell me when you're finished with the CPU. Preemptive, non-cooperative uh, multitasking is, I'm just gonna take control of the processor back from you. This is something again, that the hardware and software and the operating system have to work together to accomplish. The way that the hardware and software work together to do this is using something called an interrupt and using something called a timer. A timer is a physical piece of hardware that exists on a system that's basically responsible for timing, timing, but also issuing certain events every so often. The event that we're going to, to talk about here is called an interrupt. How this works in hardware, let's just you know magically hand wave this for now and forever until maybe you get to something like Comp 3370 or the corresponding uh, engineering computer engineering course where you would talk about uh, low level things like interrupts. But let's just say that there is an interrupt that happens. And in a way that's similar to this trap table for handling system calls, the operating system can basically say at boot time, hey, when this timer interrupt happens, this is the code that you should call. So this is figure 6.3 now, limited direct execution protocol with timer interrupt. At boot time, so on the left side of this table, we've got initialized trap table. So this is now going to do two things. Remember the syscall handler, but now also the timer handler. Start the interrupt timer. And then the hardware starts the timer and it interrupts the CPU in so many milliseconds. So however often the operating system and the, and the hardware are kind of coordinating to say, we're gonna do this every so often. In the, the bottom part of this diagram now, we've got the process that's starting to run. Process A, it's doing something, dot, dot, dot. And then hardware interrupt. We're gonna save those registers to the kernel stack we're gonna to move to kernel mode and then jump to the trap handler. We're gonna handle the trap in the operating system itself. So this is the timer that's being fired. And then we're going to call the switch routine. This is our scheduler. We're gonna talk about this later, but for now we're gonna call this a black box that just says, this is the next process that should be run on the processor. The switch routine then is going to do this thing called a context switch. We've got multiple processes that are running on the system. It's going to have this responsibility of saving the context of a process. The context of a process is the state of the CPU at the time that the process has been taken off of the CPU. So that hardware interrupt is going to save some of those registers enough so that the operating system can start taking control. The operating system then is going to save even more registers, the state of even more registers into the process control block. So the data structure for the process itself. And then it's going to restore registers. So for some other process, it's going to start saying, hey, these are the values that this process had the last time it was taken off of the CPU. Set those back up, go back into to hardware mode, the hardware mode is going to restore the final remaining registers. So things like the program counter for process B, and then it's going to jump to process B's program counter. So now we have a complete setup. We've limited access to certain instructions for processes. We've got yielding control by syscalls, but now we've also got forcibly, forcible preemption, non-cooperative multitasking. We are now able to regain control of the processor using hardware by getting the timer to fire interrupts for us and get basically give us back control from that process. Figure 6.4 has some code from this operating system called XV6. And this code basically has assembly language instructions for taking registers off and putting them into the process control block of a specific process. So this is code that's responsible for context switching. This has to be written in assembly language. This has to be written in an assembly language. 
And I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave it for you to think about why would this have to be written in an assembly language? Why can't this code be written in C? Why does it have to be written in an assembly language? And what does that mean for when we want to take an operating system and have it run on multiple different kinds of processors? So I'm going to let you think about that. So that's pretty much it for what we've done in chapter six. We've got limiting access, user mode and kernel mode and mode switching. We've got system calls. We've got our syscall handler. We've got things that look like functions but aren't really functions. They're initialized with this trap table. We've got cooperative multitasking where processes give up control of the processor by making syscalls. So they're asking the operating system to do something. And at that point, the operating system can do things like switch to another process. And now we've also got non-cooperative multitasking. So limited direct access. The operating system can regain control of the processor with the cooperation of hardware using something like a timer. That's it for this week's uh, summary video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all later. Bye.